today on Missing Link. What connects television broadcasting with the Himalayas? Where's the connection between the world's highest peak and an outer bound? What do outer bounds and sharks have in common? And how could a shark be linked with cannibalism? There aren't any links? Oh yes there are, you just have to look really hard. Missing Link. Guglielmo Marconi was the pioneer of wireless communications. In England at the end of the 19th century, he made a breakthrough in the transfer of electromagnetic waves. The press reported on the first radio contact between a ship and dry land. It wasn't long before Marconi had managed to transmit his magical waves across the English Channel to the French coast. All the newspapers of the day covered the story. Even Queen Victoria invited Marconi to her royal residence on the Isle of Wight, where he installed a wireless device. The Queen kept in daily contact with her son, the Prince of Wales, who was on his yacht near the island. Eventually, Marconi went to the USA to make a wireless report about two sailing yachts in the America's Cup. The first live sporting broadcast in history was a sensation. In Germany, Wilhelm II was impressed by the invention and commissioned Adolf Slaby, a professor of electrical engineering, to find out all he could about the new wireless technology. His assistant was the physicist Georg Graf von Arco. Graf von Arco was soon to become the co-founder and director of the mighty AEG Corporation. In England, Slaby closely studied Marconi's devices and then built exact copies. He called the new technology Funken, sparks in German, because of the sparks produced between the metal balls when the electromagnetic waves were released. Kaiser Wilhelm II recognized the communications possibilities that could be opened up with the new technology for the military and especially for his naval fleet. What Slavi had learned in England was to prove very significant. You could describe what he did as industrial espionage. He witnessed the experiments in England and when he returned to Berlin, he reproduced them. Without his work, without his espionage, wireless communications would have started much later in Germany. Slavi begins his first experiments in Berlin. He transmits a signal from a nearby building to his office at the Technical University. But his experiments cause massive problems for the Berlin telephone network. Nonetheless, Slavi is convinced he can master the new technology and catch up with Marconi. Wilhelm II is seeking to smash Marconi's monopoly in wireless communications, and he instigates the founding of the Telefunken Company. It would unite all the German competitors, and thus all their knowledge and production capability. The world's first transmitter station was built at Nauen, just outside Berlin. And before long, Telefunken began competing with Marconi's company for lucrative foreign markets. The age of telecommunications had begun. At an altitude of 5,000 meters, European geographers and geologists are studying the effects of climate change on the highest mountain range in the world. But what's the connection between radio transmission and the Himalayas? The tiny kingdom of Bhutan lies at the foot of the Himalayas. It's about the size of Switzerland, but its mountains are a bit higher. Not a great deal more is known about the country, really, whose name in its language means Land of the Thunder Dragon. Apart from its presence on the national flag, the dragon isn't to be seen elsewhere. Bhutan is, quite simply, tranquil. Perhaps it's down to Buddhistic equanimity and the expanses of time one has in which to consider whether we really need all of our technical gadgetry. Which is why this tiny country sitting directly under the roof of the world took so long to express any interest at all in one technical gadget. 
Not until 1999 did Japan introduce the television. That's a hundred years after Paul Nitkov's invention of the electric telescope. Bhutan, land of the Thunder Dragon, has just one channel that shows all day long Missing Link. No, it doesn't really. It churns out the same stuff as everywhere else. Stories about the royal family and health magazine programs. Hmm, do you really need a TV station for that? Well, we've got a better idea. A show from the roof of the world. Come on then, guys. Get the stuff together. We're off. The vast glaciers of the Himalayas feed many of Asia's largest rivers. The Yangtze, Mekong and Ganges supply water to hundreds of millions of people. The huge masses of ice form the largest freshwater reserve on the continent. If these glaciers start to melt, it could endanger the livelihoods of millions of people. And indeed, it seems that the ice is receding at an alarming rate. If satellite images are to be verified, they have to be correlated with observations on the ground. This will be the task of a team of experts from Dresden, Munich and Graz. At 2,700 meters in Lukla, Nepal, they set out on their research trip. It will take them to an altitude of 5,000 meters on the roof of the world. The team consists of geographers, cartographers and geologists. Their aim is to develop methods of getting realistic data about changes due to global warming from satellite images. The scientists are facing a formidable challenge. Every member has to carry up to 40 kilos of equipment. The ascent takes 10 days to complete. And finally they've made it. They set up camp at 5,000 meters. The team will camp here at the Imja and Nupsi glaciers for the next 10 days. The scientists start their tests with a kite. Tobias Bolsch and project leader Manfred Buchreutner carefully attach the well padded camera to the kite string. Dozens of previous attempts have failed in the thin mountain air, but they keep trying. And finally their efforts are rewarded. The kite quickly climbs to over 100 meters. I didn't expect it to climb that steeply. The kite's eye view immediately pays off. The flow structure in the scree reveals the former extent of the glacier. There's no doubt that it has receded. Now they have to check if the satellite images accurately depict the outer edges of the glacier. The Nupsi glacier is hidden by a vast covering of scree. So. The experts measure the reflection of the surface using a spectrometer. Ice and rocks have different reflective properties. A comparison with the satellite spectrometric data sheds light on the matter. I've got 001. That's the reading here. The readings confirm their suspicions. The areas where the satellite still shows ice prove to be mainly rocks on the ground. One day later, on a different glacier, the spectrometer can't penetrate the thick scree on the edge of the ice mass. The scientists suspect that ice lies underneath it, but how thick is it? The area has changed since Bolch last came here. As we can see here, it goes up to Island Peak. The small hanging glacier you can see there used to go down much further into the valley. To form a reliable picture of the dramatic changes that are evident here, the experts need more observation data. That means a few more days at camp and further measurements. But then the weather turns bad. The scientists are forced to return to their base camp. By the time they get there, the temperature has dropped to minus 15 degrees Celsius. Will it be possible to continue the expedition? The team decides to wait one more night. If more snow falls, they'll have to cancel the project. The next day, the weather is fantastic. 
Bolt, ja, und Buchreutner sees the opportunity to compare the satellite image of the Arma da Blam glacier with direct observations of the gigantic rock face. The form and angle of the slopes show where ice is hidden beneath the screen. It's really unbelievable how much it's receded. This is genau what we can see down there the Rand, is the edge of the tongue. The, the tongue. Downturns. They spend six weeks on the roof of the world. It would seem that global warming has had a far greater impact on the Himalayas than previously believed. The team has obtained valuable data that will help them to interpret satellite images more accurately in future. Traffic jams on the motor are nothing new. Ants are smarter. They avoid traffic jams. But how are the Himalayas and motorways connected? Many people have ambivalent feelings towards highways. On the one hand, of course, it's nice to be able to travel from A to B quickly. But on the other hand, it's not so nice when the express highway happens to run right by our bedrooms. There are those to whom the highway is the symbol of personal freedom, whereas others see it as a nature-hating destructive strip of tar. And then there are those who have dubbed a certain highway in northwestern China as the ninth wonder of the world, or the biggest construction project since the pyramids, both of which are a bit over the top. But top is a word you could accurately use to describe it. The Manali Lei Highway runs from the Chinese oasis of Kashgar to Islamabad in Pakistan and is the highest in the world. Starting at a height of 5,000 meters, it winds its way up the Himalayas. Since its opening, this highway of dizzying heights has proved itself to be a world wonder and a tourist attraction. And many tour guides hike it up to be a legend. Isn't it amazing what a strip of tar can do to raise our spirits? So think about that next time you're stuck in a traffic jam. Every morning it's the same story. The steel convoy stops and starts, and in large conurbations or during holidays, chaos on the roads is commonplace. Due to traffic jams, we lose money, time, and our patience. The biologist Audrey Dussatour of the University of Toulouse studies a totally different kind of congestion. She's attempting to decipher the traffic rules of ants. Dussatour prepares the lure, a sweet tasting sugar solution. A bridge connects the nest to the source of food. Everything is documented in minute detail. The first scouts swarm out. The ants hurry back and forth. On the way back to the nest, they mark the route with a special scent as a sign for their companions. I find that fascinating because they operate in a totally different way to us. Ant society is completely unlike ours, where there are bosses everywhere who give commands. Ants are self-organizing. There are no bosses. In fact, the organization is on a local level. There is no chef in the fourmis. But do ants have traffic jams like us? The bridge grows narrower, just like a motorway road works. But the traffic continues to flow smoothly. Audrey de Sautour carries out a head count. I've been studying ant motorways for nine years now, and I've never witnessed a traffic jam. I've tried many times to create an ant traffic jam, but so far I've not managed to do it. Never. The ants regulate their movements without any traffic lights or stop signs. The insects share a common goal, to keep the traffic moving without disruption. That's the only way to ensure that they get enough food. But just how flexible is the ant system? In the next experiment, the ants have to negotiate two diamond intersections, one wide and one narrow. The insects use both lanes on the narrow intersection. At the wider intersection, this isn't necessary, and all the ants take the same lane. They mark their route with pheromones. The analysis shows that the ants manage to keep moving without disruption. Avoiding congestion is a matter of survival for them. 
la principale différence entre le trafic chez les hommes et le trafic chez les fourmis, c'est que chez l'homme, les gens ont des buts qui sont différents les uns des autres. Donc, il y en a qui vont, par exemple, au magasin, certains vont au travail, etc. Chez les fourmis, le but est commun. Toutes les fourmis vont fourrager pour la commune. Donc, elles ont intérêt à coopérer puisqu'elles défendent un but commun. We don't share a common goal on the roads, and that's why we frequently have traffic jams. The best idea is simply to leave the car at home. It's better for your nerves and for the environment. Sharks are constantly getting caught on fishing lines. The result is the senseless slaughter of these ocean creatures. But what's the link between sharks and motorways? the voyages of the endless expanses of the oceans. They're to be found in all the seven seas. Sharks. If you think that they just swim haphazardly about, you'd be wrong. Sharks use water like we use highways. There are clearly defined routes in the depths of the ocean that they travel along. Scientists are unable to agree exactly why these trails exist. One reason might be the presence of stable currents, allowing sharks to rapidly cover long distances. Another has been suggested that is linked to their amorous side, because out there in the vast oceans there aren't that many sharks to partner up with. But whatever the reason, there's no question. There are highways and of course service areas, one of which lies between Mexico and Hawaii. This is the hangout predominantly of great whites, and the reason that divers apply the name White Shark Cafe to it. Here, before getting underway on their long journey to the Pacific, those great whites fill up to the top, so they can just keep miles. The fishing boat Outlaw in the Gulf of Mexico. The crew is out to catch swordfish, a lucrative job. Swordfish are a threatened species, so each boat can only catch a limited number of them. Today the crew's joined by marine biologist Patrick Rice, who's acting as an observer for the fisheries authority. Swordfish are caught using a long line fishing technique, which employs kilometer long lines with hundreds of hooks, each baited with a piece of squid. The lines have been in the water since last night. Now the men haul in the fish one after the other. but the squid attracts other animals too. A shark is caught on a hook. The crew haul the dead fish on board. One after another, they haul several silky sharks, night sharks and hammerhead sharks on board. The cadavers are thrown back into the sea where they'll be eaten. It's an utterly senseless massacre of the sharks, and Patrick Rice is shocked every time he witnesses it. There must be a way to prevent this unnecessary slaughter. Specimen to use for these kind of captive studies, they they do well in the in the tank. Patrick and, and his colleague you know, Charlie are preparing an experiment. All over their nose, uh, they've their caught a small and, uh, scalloped hammerhead for the purpose. They, uh, their idea wider, is to exploit the shark's unique ability, uh, its sixth yeah, sense, what makes them a prime, in order to uh, keep it away from the for, hooks. For research that we do but to carry out the experiment, they have to put the shark in a type of mating trance. And hammerheads have many, many ampullae of Lorenzini distributed all across the cephalofoil. And this is what they use to hunt animals that are buried in the sand that are giving off bioelectric fields from their heartbeat. The experiment begins. The shark doesn't react when a hand approaches it. The second test object is a piece of styrofoam. Which should have no magnetic fields associated with it whatsoever. The shark remains calm. However, a magnet stimulates the shark's ampullae of Lorenzini. Its sixth sense has been activated. The scientists aim to exploit this violent reaction to protect the endangered sharks. First, they release their small hammerhead into the wild again. It's quite distressed by the magnet experiment, as we can see by the pale tone of its skin. It swims off again, relieved. Back on board the outlaw, Patrick and Charlie's findings now have to be tested out at sea. The 
fishermen attach chemical light sticks and squid to the hooks. It takes hours to lay out the kilometer-long line with its hundreds of hooks. Patrick has prepared special magnetized hooks made of magnesium foil. He hopes their magnetic field will drive away the sharks. Some of the bait is filled with Charlie's chemical shark repellent. The chemical is packed inside a plastic pellet, so it's released gradually into the water. There's great anticipation the following morning. The crew hauls in the lines. So I'm excited, let's see what happens. It's a promising start to the day. The first fish is a swordfish, and it won't be the last. The method seems very promising. The catch consists mainly of swordfish. A few sharks have ended up on the hooks, but there are far fewer than usual. The results, preliminary results look promising. Um, I've gone over the data curse, uh, in a cursory fashion, and it appears that we have twice as many sharks on control hooks as treatment hooks. So that tells me potentially a 50% reduction. So um, we still have, you know, a lot more testing to do to make sure that the data is sound. But again, the tests seem positive. Despite these efforts, it won't be possible to prevent all unwanted catches. But even if only half the number of sharks were killed, it would save the lives of millions in the USA alone. Strange bones found in a cave in the Hart Mountains caught the attention of scientists. Were there cannibals here? And what do sharks have to do with cannibalism? Cannibals and man-eaters rank among the scariest of our legends. We've all heard about adventurers and discoverers who on their journeys through the undiscovered regions of the earth have ended up in the cooking pot and on the menu. But what in civilized human society is considered unthinkable is quite normal in other animals, and so it is with some types of shark. Although we're talking here about a special kind of cannibalism, it could be called prenatal cannibalism. There are some types of shark that are egg-laying, whereas the majority give birth to their young. But not birth as in mammals, the young hatch within the womb. But here's the creepy bit of the story. In sand-like sharks, the first hatchling out devours its siblings in the womb. Only then, on a full tummy, does it venture out into the ocean as a baby shark. Who would have thought it? A nice little tiddler enters the world and is already an infanticidal maniac. Innocent little children, my eye. A peaceful evening in the Hearts. A team of archaeologists is planning to examine some suspicious evidence in the nearby cave. Ten years ago, they documented a gruesome find at the end of a barely passable tunnel. Thousands of prehistoric human and animal bones laying on a cavern floor. Remains of skeletons covered with incisions and burn marks were found in ancient hearts. Only a few experts are able to find the hidden entrance on the Liechtenstein Hill in the Western Hearts region. The scientists have brought along special LED lamps in their search for a different entrance. The heavy iron door protects the site from grave robbers. Is this really the only entrance to the Liechtenstein Caves? The entry tunnel is just 30 centimeters wide. Progress is slow and laborious. The team crawls centimeter by centimeter towards their goal. Here in Bernstein, we have a widespread layer of human bones. Thousands of bones spread all over the place. Some of the bones have been stacked near the walls of the cave. Here, for example, there were five human skulls side by side. Es gab in der Höhle mehrere very narrow extrem enge Stellen, die waren so eng, dass man sich eigentlich nicht vorstellen konnte, dass man durch diese extremen Engstellen Tote hätte hindurchbringen können. Find, ja, und unser erster Eindruck von diesem gewaltigen Befund war, dass es sich vielleicht um die Reste von Menschenopfern handeln könnte.
A further clue. Animals in the burial chamber with cuts and burn marks. Fish and even dogs had been eaten here. Were these meals really part of a sacrificial ceremony similar to other known cultures? They could also be evidence of a burial site if there was a larger entrance tunnel. There we are. It's a hole. And it's pretty deep too. Is there a breeze coming out? No, there's no breeze and it stops here. It turns out to be a difficult task. There are too many branches in the Liechtenstein cave system. The 120 meter long passage opens up to the Bernd chamber, where Flint discovers the bones of men, women and adolescents. Now they'll need to put the LED lights into operation. We're going to need your lights here. A flu shaft that rises up vertically from the bound chamber has caught Flint's attention. His colleague follows it up for nine meters. But then... It might go on further up there, but it's blocked. Flint intends to examine it more closely from the outside, in the hope of finally discovering the blocked off entrance. Here they are on the hill above the burial chamber. It's over there. Let's take a closer look at that small hole. Flint knows this territory like the back of his hand, but maybe he overlooked something. On the rock. Drag it away so we can get to it more easily. Yeah, there's a crack running down there. This looks like something. An entrance that's big enough for dead bodies to pass through. And it's hidden too, so no one would desecrate their resting place. There are no rocks. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. The prehistoric Liechtenstein humans could have accessed the cave through a more direct passage. The human sacrifice theory is looking shaky. We're in the vicinity of where the prehistoric entrance must have been. The place where the dead were brought into the cave. They would have used a 9 meter high vertical shaft like this one to abseil the dead down into the main cavern. Rather than being a human sacrifice chamber, it seems the Liechtenstein cave is a secret burial chamber in which sacred rituals were held in honor of the dead. Ritual meals beside the dead, the bizarre death rites of our ancestors.